Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. Barry LePatner is one of my favorite guests. He is the founder of LePatner & Associates, one of the nation's foremost construction law firms. I drew on his expertise for a book I wrote several years ago, and since then we've discussed everything from infrastructure to politics and government, and even some of the great New York sports teams of the past. Now he's turned his considerable talents to something different. He's done extensive research on the aging process, and he's organized his findings, thoughts, and insights into a paper he's titled, 80 is the New 60. It's fascinating, and we're going to discuss it now. Barry, welcome. Thanks for coming in. Bob, always a pleasure. So the title, 80 is the New 60, should be self-explanatory, and goodness knows at my age, um, I hope you're right. <laughs> um, but uh, tell me how you got on to this project. It's been an evolving story for me. I remember when I was a boy growing up in Brooklyn, I would go to family events. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, I would hear a voice, my mother, calling to me. And she would say, <laughs> Barry, bring a piece of cake to Aunt Tessie and Uncle Saul. They're sitting on the couch. They can't get up. <laughs> and there were these two relatives curled up in a kind of fetal position, arthritic to the bones, right. <laughs> and other old age ills, which really saddened me, but I came later on to understand that they were probably at that time 55 or 57 years something? old, right. and a hard life through a depression, right. through World War II, working all the time, had brought them to that stage because they didn't have good health care and an understanding of how to live longer and live healthier. In 1960, that the average lifespan in America was 69.7 years, but men only lived to 66.6 years, so? which means they retired and had hardly an opportunity to spend any retirement Right, years. you couldn't enjoy a retirement. You know, you retire and then it's over. There were no golden years in those golden years. Right. Consider this. By 2022, the worldwide statistics showed we had more people aged 65 and older on Earth than we had younger people under the age of five. That's staggering. Okay? In America, where we have 337 million people, Okay, we had 89,000, almost 90,000 centenarians. <laughs> and that had doubled over the past 20 years. In the old days, it was shocking if someone lived to be 100 years old. You'd be like, oh my God, it, you know, now there's just so many. But it's the story of how we got there and how we are continuing to transition to lives that are older and healthier, which is really the amazing thing that started me on this journey right. to try to understand this process. Because what we realized, came to realize and what the study started to show was that your age and your healthful longevity were malleable. <laughs> they could be expanded. Right. And we were learning and also being taught by advances in science, medicine, technology, and research that really meant that we can now have golden years during our golden years. So now people are living longer, and of course, what's crucially important is the quality of life um, has improved um, tremendously for the people uh, who are older. Before we get into the specifics, kind of a, a, a general question. Talk a little bit about um, sort of the wisdom and experience that comes with age <laughs> and how that can, can benefit all of us if, if, if we can learn to appreciate it. Well, it's an interesting thing when you start to talk about wisdom. When we were younger and as we grew into the world that we enveloped, we found out there's not necessarily a correlation between getting older and being wise. <laughs> right. 
We kind of learned that in lots of different ways. Doesn't always work that way. No, older did not mean wiser, okay? Not everybody became some mythic figure in the Lord of the Rings. But when you study the subject, you find the following. When we are younger, we learn through what's called fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is the process of acquiring information from our environment, from our schools, from our parents, from our community leaders. And we learn and we memorize and all this stuff comes into us like a sponge. And that fluid intelligence is how we try to solve problems. It lasts, says the psychologists, until middle age when it begins to get replaced by what they call crystallized intelligence. And crystallized intelligence is a different form of intelligence. It says, you've now absorbed all of this information, all of these experiences. You've learned what's right, what's wrong. And what you get is a perspective that takes all of that knowledge and puts it together into what is often called wisdom. Mm -hmm. So we get older, and if we learn how to take this information that we got and package it together in ways that explain situations that we could pass on to younger people, that wisdom becomes one of the most valuable assets we get as we grow older and be part of our communities and our families. One of the main reasons why people are living longer, of course, are some of the um, amazing advances in medical care that have occurred over the past half century, actually. Um, and, um, y you know, people are sort of generally aware of this, but what are some of the specific advances that have struck you as you were doing your research? Well, they fall into two categories for me. One is the huge amount of research that has been done in areas of sickness, disease, what debilitates us as we got older, and what we can do to prevent those sicknesses from getting into our body that make old age seem older rather than more youthful. Right. In the 1960s, Walter Cronkite got on national television. He was talking about our health care system. And he said, our national health care system is neither healthy nor caring nor a system. <laughs> in these succeeding decades, what have we found? We found that research has been looking into what's the importance and the process of nutrition. What's the importance of our gut and the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of microbes that are in our gut? What, are they, what purpose do they serve? What's the value of our immune system? And they've developed mechanisms that in effect are reversing what has happened financially. We were spending a trillion dollars caring for sick people when we should be spending all of that money avoiving sickness and learning how to avoid it. medicine. So there's a current book out, it's a bestseller and it's pretty knowledgeable about, uh, it's written by a doctor called Peter, his name is Peter Atia, And what he writes about are the four horsemen of disease, um, Alzheimer's, heart failure, diabetes, and cancer. Mm -hmm. And he goes into great lengths what science is now doing, either to help you avoid those four horsemen or early identify so that you can treat so it and still go on yeah. to a long, healthy life. Yeah, cancer used to be a death sentence. People were ashamed to know, to say there was cancer in the, in, in the family. But basically, if you got cancer, it was assumed it was all over. It was a death sentence. Yep. At the end of the book, interestingly enough, he says, my patients come to me and they ask me if there's only one thing I had to do <laughs> instead of eat well and stay <laughs> off uh, cookies, cake, and candy. What would I do? And he says, interestingly, exercise. So these are things that can guide us and our doctors can help us on. But I had a personal experience about exp expanding your healthful life. I played football in high school and college. And the residue of that was two terrible knees with no cartilage. <laughs> so I spent three decades with my knees pounding like this on the tennis court, and they were painful. Pain, it's real, it's, it's pain. Incredible pain, right. Yes. 
I couldn't get down on the floor with my children to play. Yeah. I had to kind of slump down because I would not get up. My knee doctors said, look, if you want a knee operation, we'll slice the tendons on both sides, we'll replace the knee, you'll spend one full year on crutches and rehab physical training. And then you'll spend another year doing it on the second knee. Right. And I, and they said, by the way, that'll last about 15 years. I didn't think that was a great idea. Until 2010, when I went to them, I said, where are we? And they said, well, we got good news. We're gonna do a half knee replacement for you. And two things. One, you're gonna be back on the tennis court in four months. <laughs> and number two, a good part of that operation is going to be done by a robot. Oh, wow. I took that first <laughs> operation. I was back on the tennis court in four months. Two years later, I did the second operation, back on the tennis in, in court in four months. Two years after that, I had a hip replacement, back on the tennis court in four months. And today, 10 years later, I'm playing with younger people. I'm hitting with tennis pros. And I'm proud to say I can still serve at 85 miles an hour. <laughs> In the old days, it, would have been, it was just unheard of. It, yeah. uh, you'd you'd be been, almost like a cripple. I've been you, sitting you know. there on the yeah. couch. One of the things that's um, uh, really important, and, and, and you point this out, is in addition to diet and exercise, um, and you, you mentioned briefly preventive uh, medicine, um, one of the things that's really important is the um, maintaining social networks and friendships and that sort of thing. Um, why is that so important? And also, in addition, how do you keep doing it? If you get into your 60s and 70s and 80s, I mean, sadly, you begin to, to lose relatives, uh, friends, and that sort of thing. Um, it's not that easy to maintain these um, friendships, but how do you do it? And why is it so important? When we're younger, we are full of ambition. We're going to climb that ladder of the business world, of the whatever worlds we're in. We're raising our kids. We don't have enough time to do anything. And we're social in the context of raising our children. Yep. Or some or, business or affiliations. Yep. Yeah. As you get older, the importance of social relationships rises geometrically. Once we get older, the, the statistics, the studies show that if you have three or more good social relationships with friends, with people you know in your bridge group, mm -hmm. your gardening group, the people you take walks with, the people at your PTA meetings and so on, the richness of those relationships has an effect on your brain, your stress levels, your hormone levels, your immune systems. And there are fabulous studies which prove this, that you can extend your remaining the years of your life 200% by having social relationships. Now, what's the most significant of those social relationships? If you are fortunate enough to have a spouse right. who brings to you the richness of understanding you, listening to you. You can have conversations that you can't have with other people because you're talking about your deepest thoughts. You're sharing excitement over a new movie that you both went to or looking forward to a trip that you're gonna go on. Mm -hmm. they talk, the studies show that that kind of social relationship, that personal link, has so much value that you can extend your life to 80, 90, and 100 in a quality, healthful way. And in the absence of those kinds of relationships, those kinds of friendships or, or spouse, um, you're so vulnerable to loneliness and to depression, which we know is debilitating and can, sh can shorten, shorten your life. You know? Isolation is one of the biggest reasons why people die early. Yep. They don't have anybody to relate yep. to. The depression that comes with it sends them into really bad physical conditions. So there is a real correlation between feeling good about yourself because you have these social relationships and looking forward to each day and the new that's gonna come because you're gonna interact with your family, with your friends, in your community. 
Which leads me to my next question, because we've talked about the importance of exercise and, of course, social relationships and stuff. Uh, but it's also important to stay mentally um, active. When you talk about staying mentally active, especially as you're getting older, what kind of things are you talking about? You're not, you're not in, in college. You might be retired, so you're not mentally active in the, in the workplace or in the work, you're not in the workforce anymore. Uh, what kind of things are you talking about? There's a lot of interesting studies and some interesting books that have come out in the last few years that say that when you have gotten to a point where there are no more mountains to climb in your 50s, when you recognize, I've about achieved what I'm going to achieve. It's mm -hmm. not like I'm ascendant to the corporate ranks. What you come to understand is the value of the constructive things you do giving of yourself to your community, giving to charity, working in a community garden to grow plants that you give to people to grow food. The mental health of an individual who feels good about him or herself has enormous value to their internal health and also the people around them. I've come to call that protecting the franchise. <laughs> because if you are employing people, right. they're looking to you and expect you to stay healthy. Right. If your family looks to you as a leader of the family, an elder of the family, someone who looks, helps them look at your children, look after your grandchildren when you're away on a business trip, you have an importance that overrides just the fact that you're the grandpa or the grandmother, over, overrides the fact that you're just the father of these people, these uh, millennials and Gen Xers who are the grandchildren. And that mental ability means you can have a second new, uh, chapter in your life. And in order to, to, to maintain those kinds of relationships that you're talking about, to, to stay active in that sense, you have to know what's going on. You have to, you have to continue to read. You have to be o o aware of what's happening in, in, in the culture and in, in the political life and that sort of thing. And I've read that it's even important, that, you know, for the people who continue to do um, play games and, and do crossword puzzles and stuff. Just keep keep that mind active, you know. So, curiosity is one of the best things to have as you get older. Yeah. Interest in in opening yourself up to new ideas, new thoughts, new realms of experience that you never had before, and. What the science says is that by keeping your mind active, doing Wordle every morning, if you <laughs> publicize the New York Times, you're from the employer, uh, doing crossword puzzles, Sudoku, getting out there playing bridge and canasta, all of these things yeah. that allow you, your mind to be active and make associational connections, fends off Alzheimer's disease is in one instance is what yep. they show. Yep, yep. And it helps promote those social relationships and friendships that we're talking about. You have things to talk about with other people. You have things to do um, with, other, with other people. Yeah, I mean, when, we, when people in our prior generation, our parents' generation, hit 60 and knew they were going to re be retiring, they almost formed a, what called, was called a terror of death. It right. was imminent. Yeah. And you think yeah. about it all the time. It yeah. was very much on their minds. But you know, um, if people are going to live longer, so and 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 for many years, uh, in many cases, after retirement, uh, in a very practical sense, you're going to have to be able to afford it. So now, um, let's talk a little bit about financial pr planning. Think about our parents' generation. They went through a Great Depression. They went through World War II. They got into the age of the 60s, yeah. 1960s, and they were going to die very shortly. Right. Whatever small savings they had, whatever Social Security they had, it was enough to last them these finite few years that they had. Our generation grew up at a time when the economy was very good and right. rising. With the rise of the middle class happens from 1945 to 1980. Yep. Okay. During that time, 
people had enough money to put down seven thousand dollars and buy a home. Isn't that something? <laughs> that matriculated. <laughs> now that's the mortgage. <laughs> and that's the, the monthly rent for one bedroom or two bedroom apartment in New York City right. and San Francisco. But they accumulated wealth by the rise of the value of their homes, yeah. and successive homes. We had pension plans that corporations put into place. Small businesses had their own mechanisms to save money. Individuals had IRA accounts. Right. And here's what the studies show. The boomer generation was very conservative in the way they invested. 69% had investments in stocks. Yep. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds, but only three or four percent ever invested in crazy things like cryptocurrency. Oh. That means as conservative investors, they built up wealth. Right. What is the extent of that wealth? Let me tell you what a new study just showed. Our generation of baby boomers from 2014 to 2045 is going to spread wealth to the millennials, who are their children, and the Gen Xers, who are our grandchildren, yep. equaling $84 trillion. Wow. And here's the interesting thing. Half of that, half of that is not coming from the high net worth people. It's coming from the school teachers, the accountants, the people who worked in pharmacies, yep. the people who had small businesses, small contractors. All of them were able to have money set aside, plan, and so as a group, we were conservative and wealth gatherers, which is allowing us to go into our older years, 70, 80, and 90, along with Social Security, to have monies to make them truly golden in many cases. The, um, there are also, um powerful government and public policy implications um, when you're talking about an older uh, population, an aging population. Can you talk about that a little bit? This is where we get into the area of government being behind the eight ball a little bit and not being ahead and moving into what's going on from, an instant, from a national standpoint. We constantly hear that Social Security is being threatened. Mm -hmm. And one of the real reasons is that historically during the last 40, 50, 60 years, the United States has been one of those countries where the birth rate was over 2.1, which means we're replacing with new, yep. new generation those who are dying off. When that number slips below 2.1... That new generation brings a whole new workforce and, that are contributing to Social Security. And if there's not enough of them... Right. They don't put enough money into to support the people who are retiring. So we are running into that situation on one hand. And number two, we are facing other larger problems that look like they're going to sap zillions of dollars of governmental money, like global warming uh, and problems like that, where we I got to attend to our national um, well-being as a society. So. Government has to start dealing with the contingencies of an aging society and whether or not a younger society is going to be sufficient the next generation to pay, which gets into a whole new subject of the importance of migration. Right, right. And people don't look at migration um, that way. They, uh, they, they look at migration in a simplistic way and they think only about the problems. One of the things that you and I always seem to come back to is infrastructure, the thing nobody ever wants to talk about. But um, an aging population means that there are infrastructure requirements as well. Can you talk about that a little bit? Aging population coupled with the demographics of our nation is a whole other story because for the last 30, 40 years, the patterns of our, our growth of our country have been to population moving from the north and northeast to the south and southwest. As we speak, there are boundaries being drawn for new cities that ultimately were many millions of people in the southwest. Counties like Larimer County, north of Denver, are some of the fastest growing counties in the country. New Mexico, Arizona, 
all are fast growing parts of our country. And when they grow and they expand, they need railroads, they need highways for the supply chain, they need hotels, schools, uh, residential. All of this is part of infrastructure because they also need an electric grid yep. or a solar pa panel grid or <laughs> some other type of powering of electricity. And all of this at a time when we're in the, in the midst of global warming, but, but... Have we taken a step towards that? Not really, because the Biden infrastructure plan, which has furnished almost a trillion new dollars that are going into the society, is going to attend to old needs and bring them up to current standards. And yes, they're providing well-paying jobs and the like, but we're gonna need another infusion to deal with the growth of our country into a part of our nation that is largely undeveloped right. from these purposes. So, um, Barry, it's always good to see you. This time, I really hope you're correct that 80 is the new 60. Um, thanks so much for coming by. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Bob. And uh, viewers, thanks for watching, and uh, we will see you next time.